we go. So we're recording whenever you're ready. Fab. So, um, hi everybody. It's the first time I've been at this group. So we're here to talk about neighbourhood democracy and we're going to tell you about Barnes's journey around the area governance model. Um, so that's what we're going to talk to you about today. So we're going to give you an overview of our area governance journey, um, the recent external peer feedback that we've got and what continuous improvement we've got moving forward. I know this is a bit of a busy slide, um, but it does tell you, it, uh, I'm quite pictorial with how I describe things. So it does tell you the journey. So if you start in 2011, um, the council has had a traditional model of public engagement with pockets of best practice in neighborhood management. If you go down to 2012, austerity was looming um, and we knew we had to do things differently. Um, move up to 2013, we launched our new area governance arrangement. So we had six, well, we still got six area councils and 19 ward alliances. And I can talk you through those a little bit further on. Um, then we looked at the ward alliances, who would be at the who would be at the ward alliances. So we've got ward members, we've got um, community um, members at those groups, and we look at an asset-based approach. We set up the area councils and we began commissioning um, with a 2.1 million pound devolved budget. Um, and we launched Love Where You Live initiative, which is around volunteering um, in Barnsley. Um, in 2016, we were winners of the LGC Award for Community Engagement for Work of the Ward Alliances. 2017, we commenced our Principal Towns programme to invest five million in our local high streets. And in 2018, we launched the Town Spirit um, Awards. So if you see in the right hand corner, the building one team approach, so we brought all these things together um, in each of the six areas. So adult social care, neighbourhood nursing services, safer neighbourhood services, GP locality teams. And the ingredients were pooling resources, expecting and respecting local effort, building shared sense of what matters locally and understanding our root causes. So that gives you a bit of a potted history as to where we got to today. Just move on. So some of our successes. We're very much around social value, we're very much around um, social action, and we're very much around volunteering. So this again just gives you a bit of a picture, picture around our successes. So the six area councils and 19 ward alliances received 2.3 million um, to spend on local projects and services. And we created a massive £7,459,255 for their communities. And that's all based on match funding that we brought into local communities. Um, we have 76,444 76, hours worth um, of volunteering time, which equates to £1,032,000. Um, we look at money raised by local groups on our crowdfunder page with help of Grant Finder software to the tune of 35,000. So we have a budget, but we add very much to that budget through volunteering, match funding and other external funding sources that we can, um, we can acquire. So our collaboration in pictures, we do a lot around the environment in each of the six areas. So on the left hand side is the before and on the right hand side is the after. We work with lots of volunteers in our communities around the environment. We've got an embankment project in one of our really deprived communities in Barnsley um, where we work with our local community members. They respect that area really well because we've worked with them right from the very beginning. And we do loads of work with our communities um, to support them to help us to look after our environment. Another example, so in Peniston, um, we had the sloppy slipper, swap and information drop in. In each of the six areas that we um, commissioned services, we commissioned services around older people and social isolation, and we commissioned sloppy slipper um, projects. The middle picture of the prom dresses, we've got a prom project and for people who can't, um, who are struggling financially to send their kids to the prom, um, we support people to get access to um, dresses, to suits, to um, get into the prom. Um, and then we work a lot around um, men's groups and um, men in sheds and other. So we do a lot around mental health. We do a lot around older people. We do a lot around children and young people. And these are all locally commissioned predominantly through the volunteer community sector in our local communities. And that's with the community and for the community. So it, we've got a dementia friendly cafe. 
um, that meets in Cudworth, um, and that is just some pictures of that um, Dementia Friendly Cafe. We've got the Ho Hoyland, Milton and Rockingham Ward Alliance um, that have done some amazing work in the south of the borough. Um, and then we've got the cook and eat session. So through my team, we run all the healthy holidays projects. And um, through COVID, we've done loads around cook and eat sessions on Facebook Live. Um, we've done um, holiday hampers. And with the funding that we've got through central government at the moment, um, we're about to um, hand out our good food boxes in all our local communities for those people who are on free school meals. Um, and that's happening this week and next week, obviously, because it's Easter holidays at the moment. All of our partners, I'm sure we're missing somebody off on there, but we work with a huge amount of people in our communities. My team are really good at working with the partners in their local areas. We're very good at galvanising and getting support off our um, businesses um, and also um, through our partners like the CCG and others. So we, we have a good understanding of our communities and we work with all those partners within our communities to help us deliver what we want to deliver through our priorities. So our community response in through COVID, um, there wasn't any panic in Barnsley, she says, with her grey hairs and, no, I'm joking. Um, so we set up an emergency contact centre early doors into COVID, and my team supported the community response through the pandemic. We worked with our partners to, to, offer, to keep an up-to-date plan of the offer in local communities, so we knew what was happening when it was happening, because obviously everything changed. So we checked in with everybody, what are the times are your openings, are you still running your groups, if not, where are you running them, are you online? Um, we supported the community with the shopping requests and those who were socially isolated. So anyone who came through to the emergency contact centre and needed help around social isolation or couldn't go out because they were shielding or self-isolating, we would go and do their shopping for them. We worked with 271 volunteers who helped us to deliver that support through our communities, which was we couldn't have done without them. We worked with our VCSC partners to support the vulnerable in Barnsley with relevant move, support moving forward. So we worked with all the partners to when we've got somebody through the emergency contact centre, we'd support with that initial need and then would refer them on to the best service to continue that support with them. And like I said earlier, we delivered the healthy holidays along with other initiatives to support our communities. We did loads around activities online. We did loads of activity packs for older people and children and young people. We've done a huge amount in, in a year that, that this has been going on for. So we also had a lot of support for the voluntary community sector. We were really mindful that they were going to struggle because they couldn't fundraise. They were struggling financially. So the council um, gave my team 500,000 for a COVID-19 resilience fund. And we've supported over 80 organisations in this last year. And moving forward, we've just got another 250,000 um, to support the voluntary community sector into the next financial year. We're supporting the sector with their resilience and business planning. So we're working with Enterprise in Barnsley to support with, you know, building this robust business plan moving forward that's sustainable. And in total, in 2020, we had over £800,000 worth of funding to the sector. And that was both from the Council and South Yorkshire Community Foundation. And we also work with other funders to maximise opportunities for external funding into Barnsley. So we work with the VRU, PCC's office, um, along with the big lottery um, to make sure that we were getting every opportunity we could to support the voluntary sector in Barnsley. This is just some feedback in relation to a corporate peer challenge that we had in 2019. Um, Barnsley's approach to neighbourhood working is innovative and exemplary. Um, Area working has changed our members work in their communities. Elected members love this way of working. Um, and we've spent a lot of time with our elected members, working with them around an evidence base, looking at the priorities in local communities and steering them and guiding them to ensure that we're commissioning the right services in those local areas. And then you can see from the LGA Recovery and Renewal Peer Review, which happened in October 2020, Barnsley's neighbourhood working arrangements are a particular strength of the borough. There may be opportunities for further use of these structures and this route for community engagement and the mobilisation of volunteers who come forward in the pandemic to support job-led recovery as well as in mental health and community support. So it shows the infrastructure of our, of our board. So we've got a stronger communities partnership that oversees this work, along with the CVS strategy group, which we've um, had a couple of now in Barnsley. I've brought that um, infrastructure into Barnsley. So we've now got a really robust CVS strategy group. We've got a good food Barnsley community interest company that look at all sort of food poverty and access to food across the borough. 
We've got the Barnsley Homelessness Alliance and Energised Barnsley, and of course, Age Friendly Barnsley, which is very important to all of us um, in the borough. We've got the Integrated Care Partnership and the Children's and Young People's Trust, and that those partnerships show how they feed into the Stronger Communities Partnership, which then oversees the work around the area teams and the area governance model. Next steps. So keep telling the story of why local matters. So I do a lot of work across the partnership around encouraging people to work on a local level. Um, because I think through austerity early doors, we a lot of the areas went into a one-stop shop sort of mentality, but Barnsley absolutely didn't do that. And we've got welfare advice services happening in local communities. People just come out of the house, walk down the road to the local community centre, can access that welfare advice service rather than having to take three buses into the centre of town, which is often a barrier for people to access services. We continue to collaborate, utilising our local arrangements to support recovery and renewal effort, efforts. We've got systematic learning, thematic reviews to drive strategic plans, and we support Closer to Home and the Integration Agenda. And there's just some links that might be useful for you to click onto after, uh, after we've come out of the session. Rachel, do you want to describe how the area councils and the ward alliances work from the perspective yeah. of, of engagement and participation from people that live and residents of Barnsley? Yeah, sure. So we have six area councils. So we, Barnsley's been split into six areas and each of the area councils got is made up of elected members, along with my team who support um, the area council arena. Um, within that arena, we've got a budget that's devolved down to us, which is a revenue budget, so we can commission local services. So we do micro commissioning through those area councils. We look at the evidence, the data, the intelligence of those local communities and using local people to feed in their, their barriers to accessing services. And then we commission services through the area council. So we look at our priorities and then we commission against those priorities. So, and then the ward alliances sit below the area councils and they're made up of community members and then ward members are on those groups as well. And they have a grant um, application process. So for smaller things, say you want to run a little group in a local community, you can apply for funding through the ward alliance. You'll present it at the ward alliance meeting. You'll have a discussion at that meeting about the benefits of the, the funding going to that um, group. And then you'll look at a making a decision around whether that funding goes into that local community. And then you will get the feedback of the Ward Alliance in relation to um, the, the progress on that, um, on that specific um, application. So we have people that come to those area council meetings to present. We've got public health there, and, and that's been especially important through COVID. So we're really clear about what we can and can't do. Um, and that's how, how the area governance model works in, in Barnsley. Is that okay, Wendy? Yeah, yeah, th thank, thank you. And uh, I'd probably just say that in many ways, you know, some of the other, uh, like the Good Food Partnership, um, the Age Friendly Bar, many of these other, uh, Energised Barnsley, um, which is a, uh, as it says on the tin, an energy project, but with, with community values in it, which I chair actually, has really been quite important developments really since we started on with the sort of area-based arrangements really, which is about what, what is it, what is it, can we, can we really try and devolve down to our uh, neighbourhood but in a way that balances and, res and is respectful of the role of uh, politicians and councillors yes. and at the same time being able to balance that out with the voice of the public and find a path through these two things really I think that's been what we've been trying to craft over yeah. the last few years and um, many of the people that have been to visit us from other councils have cited that as being a very specific problem so yes. they'd be say they've not been able to advance a um a model of um, neighbourhood, you know, democracy, uh, whatever whatever term you want to use, because politics and communities are bumped up against each other, yeah. and they've not been able to find a path through it. Um, and I would probably say that, uh, from my perspective, our model um, has respectful regard for those two spaces, really, and and in that yeah. way we can nudge forward with some of the things and some of the improvements that we all want to see happening in our town. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, I totally agree. Thank, thank you very much so far for, for your presentation. And I can see that we've got uh, 
a couple of people who have put some questions, three people that mm. put questions into the chat. So if we start possibly with Simon and then Colin and then Martin, and if anybody else then has some questions, is, is, that, is that okay, Wendy and Rachel? So I'm over to you, Simon, you have a question? Yeah, well, um, I suppose I have a kind of vested interest because I think as Rachel and Wendy certainly knows, uh, I wrote a report about Barnsley's work. Mm -hmm. and I hold it in massively high regard. And I think for the issues Wendy just touched on, the thing about Barnsley that I think is worth thinking about is these have been cultural changes, mm -hmm. really somewhat led from the center. So from the team, from the council leader, and there's great strength in that. But what is impressive as an outsider, although Sheffield's not that far outside, but coming into Barnsley is how much integrity and coherence there is and how, like a lot of this is built, being built step by step, very intentionally. It's not like a one-off trick. And I think that's really, really important. And I'm saying that in a sense as a way of leading into my question though, which is, like when I was there, one of the things, and, and in, the, in some of the theoretical work I've done looking at other places in the world, one of the obvious things is that what we might mean by a neighbourhood, while that's quite a flexible thing, is probably a lot smaller than a ward. In mm. fact, looking at it in Sheffield, it seems to me that a neighbourhood, again, and I know this is a kind of a bit, there's all sorts of questions, but it's it certainly seems to correlate to primary school size. It certainly seems to be about four or five, six thousand people, you know. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and I, when I look at Iceland or I look at ancient Athens for what a demi would be, what the basic unit of democracy would be, it seems to be that kind of size, which in a ward, there's like three or four of them, roughly. Yeah. <laughs> and so I suppose it's what, I'm not really, I know that this is difficult and for exactly the reasons you talked about. What you've done is brought councillors down into connection with community and you've created a kind of balance that is changing their role and changing the conversation. But I'm curious about whether we can go that bit further down and what appetite there is for that and what appetite there is for what we might call participative democracy when actually the people because when you get down to that demi level people can just meet i mean they really can just meet and make democratic mm -hmm. decisions for themselves and that element of democracy is really rather lacking from the whole of the uk and i'm kind of hoping that barnsley will be helping us move the pieces together as neighborhood democracy tries to create a pressure from the grassroots we can meet together somehow to craft something intelligent that works for the whole system. Yeah. Difficult question, but what are your <laughs> thoughts really about this kind of pressure or issue? Do you want to respond to that, Rachel, or do you want me to? I'm happy to add to. <laughs> uh, well, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd probably say that the way that we, I don't know, create walls if you want really or you know put boundaries around things it's a bit sort of secondary in terms of my, my 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 brain really i just think that you know how people wish to and want to contribute is very much about what they want to do and, and what interests them what sparks their their interests really around getting involved or saying hang on a minute something's not quite right on my on my street and we find that don't we rachel in many yeah. many different ways in terms of we, we just the, the ward is just really how the politics are organised aren't they yes. really they're no more than that Barnsley's got 21 wards um what population of what is it now 220 so about 10k awards yeah. something like that 10k uh, population but that doesn't bind us that's just the way that we sort of are organized really in many ways really that you know people come forward with ideas and suggestions problems that they want to solve but can't find a path to solve them and and uh, we, we we've got the benefit I guess which many places don't because we took a choice when everybody well lots places were actually re were removing uh, their capacity as a consequence mm -hmm. of austerity we're removing their capacity that they'd previously seen in their neighborhood teams um and uh, it took it away as a sort of low-hanging fruit in terms mm -hmm. of response to austerity we took the different a different path and we said we wanted to invest in that actually because we thought that was the right thing to do so that's where the 2.1 million came and that's where the teams actually came from so mm -hmm. each of the area councils is supporting 
supported by an area manager and one or two community development officers. And they are actually invaluable resources because they are the people that can, alongside the VCSE or any or other community leaders in any patch or in any space, really, that they can really start to have those conversations with people about um, what it is that you're trying to improve, what it is you want to try and do, what help can we help, what, what help can we broker to help you with that? So I would probably say wards, the language of wards and areas is just a means by which we organise ourselves really. And I think um, people get involved, don't they? There are street-based projects that we do. Absolutely. Um, you know, neighbour to neighbour stuff that's done. Yeah. It, you know, it's at varying different levels that this sort of activity takes place. Yeah, I'd agree. I think we have to talk about it in a certain way, I guess, and and to organise the systems in a certain way. Um, but where the where there has been coming together, you know, like we've got twenty one wards, but we've got nineteen ward alliances because those two areas decided to come together, and that was based on local democracy. So we we have to speak about it in a certain way but like Wendy says we work at all different levels within those communities and we're really mindful and with the area council commissioning you could say in that commissioning we only want to do that in a couple of areas we don't want it for the whole area and we do that in some of our commissions so so the elected members will vote on certain things or, and the people will vote on certain things to say actually I think we're okay for that we don't need it in our area but we've got it in the two other areas out of the five so so it, it yeah, we have lots of conversations at lots of different levels and people can influence where they're at at that time. And if they want to deliver something across the whole borough, great. If they don't, then it's very much based on what they want to do. From, yeah, I mean, fair to say from the east to the west, it's a very different town. I mean, Absolutely. You look at Barnsley, at Barnsley, don't you, Simon, really, that they, you know, they, we've got quite a, you know, wealthy if you want really part of the borough and quite deprived at the other end of the borough really so what the local arrangements enable us to do is to bespoke responses to situations mm -hmm. and need in a very specific way um, so we might have the same issue to resolve the response to achieving a resolution to that issue in one neighborhood or another neighborhood east and west could look very 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 differently yeah. and we've seen that time and time again and we also know that in the uh, Penniston area there's you know it's more affluent there's better education and people are more invested in certain things so there's a whole infrastructure of vol voluntary activities that happen at a very low level so when we've looked at the support we gave through Covid we didn't really have to deploy any volunteers into the Penniston area because they'd already got well established groups that that were saying we'll lead on this just give us what you want us to do and we'll do it for you whereas in other areas like Goldthorpe and Thernsco where there isn't that well developed sort of there's lots of VCSE organisations but I'm talking about voluntary um volunteers really who have coordinated themselves in a specific way that isn't happening in that area so we had to provide more of a um, input into those areas where there wasn't that already existing infrastructure thank you and, and colin do you want to have yeah i think it's a similar it's related to simon's question really uh you know uh, neighborhood uh, democracy movements about this business trying to create a stronger more powerful voice uh, for people living in neighborhoods and communities and so on so i suppose my question is to what extent do you think uh, uh, people in communities local communities in barnsley have a real say over what happens to them and i don't just mean you know the, the really good stuff you're doing around um uh sort of grant aid and and and, and budgets uh deciding on budgets uh money and how it's going to be used i'm talking about decision making within the council on really serious issues such as for example i don't know someone wants to put a road through the place or someone wants to do uh, do a big new housing development the serious stuff the stuff that um communities are usually excluded from in, in the decision making process have you started moving towards doing something about that? Um, uh, do you believe it's necessary? That's my question. Well, any any 
any responsible council would have re uh, reasonable and robust engagement methodologies when it comes to down to planning cycles or development mm -hmm. cycles. I think it would be fair to say we've all been challenged over the last 12 months because a lot, lots of it has gone online um, in terms of engagement. And that's something that we have to start to think about and look at really um, around voice and contribution to some of those decisions. But in terms of planning developments, um, they're always local uh, dialogues, aren't they, mm -hmm. Rachel? Yeah. Having that, having that stronger communities infrastructure, if you want the area teams, um, mean that those sorts of um, propositions around development can be advanced with a, within a local dialogue as well. So yeah. there's a, a, a strong relationship between planning and development and the area teams. Yeah, I don't know if that helps in terms of the answer, but it's uh... to an extent. Um, I mean, I, I think my view is a quite radical one that uh, communities, people living in communities, communities themselves should have a participative and deliberative right to uh, participate in the decision making process. There's processes that go goes on within the council, not as a peripheral thing, not a thing that goes on external to it, but goes at the heart of the local authority as an equal right within it. Um, I haven't come across, with possible exception of Froome, I haven't really come across any local authorities that are willing to go that far, really. Well, we haven't, in the, in the way that you've just described it, we haven't gone that far. Yeah. Right. What, do you think it's a desirable thing if they did, if you did? Uh, that's an interesting question, actually, um, really. I think at the minute within Barnsley, Bar Barnsley, Barnsley are... Um, um, a, bit, a bit of echo, actually. Barnsley... Barnsley... Is that better? That's it. Um, yeah, I think Barnsley are settling itself at the minute to a bit of a mixed politics, to be honest. <laughs> that's where we are at the minute. Yeah. It's been a very steady Labour place. And then over the last 12 to 24 months, that's changed with some, you know, new politics coming into Barnsley. And I think the, the steady Labour have, have sort of tried to get their head around how they're working within a mixed politic. If I've just been really bluntly honest, uh, really, that's where we're at at the moment in, in time. I don't really know. I can't, I can't probably answer that one, Colin, really, because it's very much about, you know, what, you know your, your leadership, your, 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 the leading party, what their views are in terms of shared the sharing of power and decision making um uh you know I, i'd probably leave it there because it's probably in there it, it, you know yeah. it's probably how they mm. feel about it rather than what i feel about it as an officer it's about political leadership yeah it, yeah. it, is. Yeah. it is thank you thank you uh, thank, thanks for your uh, honesty there, Wendy, and I wonder if we could go to Ellie's question and then come back to Martin's and uh, Nick's, because it seems to follow on. Uh, uh, um, yeah, hi guys, this is my first session here with all of you, so I just wanted to say hello to start with. Um, I'm Ellie, I'm a researcher at CLES, so the Centre for Local Economic Strategies. So um, I'm here because I connected with Angela through the Transition Network, but I'm also leading our strand of policy work on deepening democracy, which is how I've kind of landed here. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'd be interested to know from you guys is whether the approach that you've taken in Barnsley has effectively opened spaces that have attracted more people who would not usually engage in local democracy, because I'm conscious that often we see when councils kind of maybe try some different things, often it's the same usual suspects who, who return to those spaces and they kind of retain some of the same characteristics. So whether you've seen that this approach has actually opened the doors and kind of removed some of the barriers for maybe some of the communities who haven't engaged with those processes. And if you've done anything to, I guess, make those spaces more welcoming for people with different approaches to maybe um, decision-making, different cultures around kind of speaking up, all that sort of stuff. So yeah. I may I'll just start that and I'll pass on to Rachel. Yes. Um, I would probably say, Ellie, that there's been a huge learning curve for councillors on this journey. Uh, there's no doubt about, about mm -hmm. that. We had to completely refresh the member development programme for councillors in Barnsley 
um, to help them to just develop practical skills about just like voice and contribution, chairing a meeting even where you've got, you know, community participants in there. Um, how do you do that in a way that's respectful? You know, we've had to recast a lot yeah. of that and you saw the feedback from the member development um, stuff on one of uh, Rachel's slides. So there's been a lot of investment in councillors because I think unless you do that mm. personally, you're on a bit of a road to nowhere because you'll see the same old, same old, same old behaviours um, occurring and councillors feeling as though the public are a major threat um, and there's to be on some unlearning and relearning done uh, for councillors there's no doubt about that that's just an introductory point um, Rachel do you want to come in on terms of the yeah. broad alliances and how that connects with a much broader church of voices I think I think having the six area teams and each of them knowing their local community so well has absolutely allowed for people who wouldn't normally be part of local democracy or even coming out to speak to anyone at all about anything has really encouraged those people. And I think there's a real understanding in each of those six areas, how each area is very different um, and how we use specific language and how we describe things. It also allows us to influence back into the council when, when there's an initiative happening and they're saying, we're going to put this out. And COVID is a, a brilliant example of that, you know, giving people the right information so they know what to do in the right language whether that's i'm from somewhere else and english isn't my first language or whether that's my literacy levels of, of 13 years old you know so i think what it has done is really allow for us and, and to the point where a lot of the community don't even think we work for the council so, <laughs> so people will say to us we'll do some really good work in a local community and they'll put on our facebook page i think the council should be doing this and we're like we are the council, don't tell anybody. Um, so so actually, I think we, we've got that really good understanding and, and absolutely we're influencing all the time, all the different partners so that when messages are going out or, or we're having conversations with local communities that they're, get, they're badged in the right arena, um, that they understand. So Towns Fund is another good example where we've got the Towns Fund in Goldthorpe, um, you know, use existing arenas, you know, don't go in and start creating your own, use those existing partnerships that are already there, they're already meeting, they'll, they, you know, they'll run the meeting for you, but you need to have proper conversations with them around that, and that bottom-up approach, so we do a lot with our local communities and giving them the space and time and that they need to have conversations with us, but equally, we, we do a lot of influencing back into when things are being planned in the council or the CCG or some other partner, so that we can influence both ways. Thank you, Rachel. And, and Nick, has that asked, answered your question? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it has done. It's been very helpful, because um, it was about the, um, the threat that councillors might feel around this type of movement um, and he talked about unlearning to be done so that's very honest again I mean I, I think this the six area teams know six area uh, councils knowing their teams really well that's that's interesting as a, a point Simon made is so valid 35,000 population is it for each of those six area councils so in a sense that's seven very distinct neighborhoods at least seven very distinct neighborhoods and how well can you truly know what's going on in each of those patches? Um, and councillors often say other people who say they understand it. Uh, they, they, they're representative and they're there, but actually they, they quite often don't and they become a barrier themselves. So I was interested in that conversation, but thank you for your answer already. That's been, that's been helpful. Yeah, Th thanks, Nick. And, and Martin, you've got a specific question if you'd like to... I, I've got two questions. Um, uh, the first one is about... Um, the threat from the far right in Barnsley, which mm -hmm. may have diminished a bit in the last couple of years. But the thing about that threat is that it, it's kind of an existential threat to a Labour council, because it's not just saying uh, we disagree with you on a single policy. It's saying Labour councils are a waste of time. They do nothing for working class people and they're in the grips of this elite or that elite. Um, and I wonder whether uh, the response to them has got to be at a, if you like, an existential level as well to say, well, as a council, we're going to take the whole of our population into our confidence about the future direction of this place. 
um, we're going to have a, a, a discussion across the town or the city about where we want to be over the next five to ten years and we want you to take part in that discussion because nothing less than that level of discussion is um, going to um, take up the challenge from the far right. Um, so that's one question. Is that, is, that a, is that a way of looking at the situation in Barnsley, which has come up in, in conversation there? And the second question is uh, much more practical. Um, Rachel, you referred to food boxes earlier on. Mm. And uh, because we're going to be doing food at a future meeting of the movement um, at the end of uh, April, I'm just interested to know um, what's in those food boxes, how much mm. they cost, and who puts them together. And if this is too detailed for uh, for today, if you could just send me a little note about it, I'd be grateful. Absolutely, yeah, I'm more than happy to set to, yeah, absolutely around the good food stuff. Okay, so I'll put my email address in the chat. So yeah, that'll be really good. I'm more than happy to send you some stuff. <laughs> So in, in, terms of the, in terms of the far right, um, usually the far right pop up uh, on the back of any sort of economic crisis. They generally appear and they generally appear in Barnsley in the most deprived, I hate that word, but the, those communities that have got a journey to go on, let's call, call it that. Um, but, um, and they have actually popped up over the last sort of six months um, in sort of Ferns, Goldthorpes and a couple of those sorts of areas really. But haven't really got any, haven't really been able to get any sort of firm hold in any of those those communities particularly, so they've trotted off um, and we, we, we've sort of not, not, not seen them uh, recently Rachel unless you tell me otherwise no. um and and I guess really the I, I, none of us are going to stop any you know the political dances that go off uh, up and down up and down the country uh, but what we can do is make sure that um, all the things we've talked about today really about people do, uh, not feeling disaffected people given uh, or afforded an opportunity to contribute people know if they've got something that they want to try and change that they've got a you know a, a route or a path to try and have a conversation about it those sorts of principles I think are just helpful to have available to individuals but in terms of shaping the almost like a, um, a, a renewal journey a recovery journey about nine months ago maybe a bit longer than that we started off with a conversation uh, with the public called Barnsley 2030 and that was we had a number of um, uh, conversation sessions all sorts of different uh, conversations sometimes thematic conversations with the business community sometimes they were with the voluntary community sector sometimes they were with, with, with just with the public generally really about what sort of place do we want Barnsley to be uh, in 2030 and we're just at the point now where we're just shaping up those uh, ambitions we've called it that ambitions and describing Barnsley as a place of possibility so we're starting to say actually whilst the council sort of corralled it really this is a plan for all of us so it's really important that we all have a voice in it we all own it and we all have a contribution to make and we're hoping to launch that I think it's about June time isn't it Rachel I think yeah. we'll be probably yeah. launching the Barnsley 2030 plan i hope that answers the question martin and martin just on top of that i've just picked up the chair of community tolerance and respect group of barnsley <clears throat> and previously in wakefield where i was a long time um i did a lot of work around cohesion similar issues wakefield and barnsley have got similar demographics predominantly white working class communities ex-mining villages and you know and levels of deprivation and poverty that allow for the far right to take a bit of a hold and similarly Wakefield had similar issues you know you get a national front demonstration coming and popping up in an area but what I'm looking at in Barnsley is 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 having that united voice and that strong voice from all the partners so that we're all providing that consistent approach so I think we, we've made some changes over the last year we'll continue to make those changes around you know inappropriate things online so we've got a new social media strategy so when someone posts something you know it's amazing what people can link to immigration you know my bins haven't been emptied and it's that person down the street's fault that, that you know all of those sorts of things so I think we are on a journey in Barnsley and I think the far right as it as it is as a group of people are around in Barnsley but it's that lower level sort of not determined as far right but 
definitely there's a level of ignorance in some communities in Barnsley. And also, you know, there's not a huge amount of diversity. We're not Sheffield, we're not Leeds, we're not Bradford. So, you know, my mission this year is very much to hopefully improve how people look at communities, look at those diverse communities. And what we have got is a really great group called the Feels Like Home group in Barnsley. And what we've seen since that, that group's been meeting is, you know, people before that group would vote with their feet. So someone got refugee status in Barnsley, they move out of Barnsley straight away. What we're seeing now is those groups choosing to stay in Barnsley because they've got those support networks and infrastructure around them. And what we're doing is very much looking at the economy, how, how different communities improve our economy and all those. So I think the message is changing in Barnsley, but we still have some of those issues. Um, you know, whether that's far right, I'd say it was, but then also some of that low level ignorance around diversity. Was Angela frozen? I think so. Look, yeah. <laughs> well, we have that expression on her face. Looks very serious. <laughs> yeah. something I've Rachel. said. Yeah, Rachel, you stunned her. She doesn't know what to say. I've stood her into silence. She looks very cross. <laughs> well, I hope that was helpful anyway. I hope that was helpful. A bit of show and tell. It was very helpful, might I say, and it was, but also a really nice discussion. And, and I suppose that's one of the things, isn't it? We're, we're all now trying to deal with this space that, in a way, the new democracy movement is trying to create the pole for your work is trying to say, mm -hmm. actually, there is a place for people to come together as neighbours and create democratic power. But we want to do that in the most constructive way possible. The point is not to rip anything apart, but is to build bridges, I suppose. And, that's, and it's great to see the work that you've done that, that actually shows a really respectful approach by um, leaders in statutory authorities, councillors, council leaders and officers. So it sets a really high bar, I think. But I think, as you also acknowledge, that it isn't quite the same as neighbourhood democracy. It's moving towards uh, building the bridge, which we need. So thank you so much.